Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cubes here, the NYC studio, partnering with the NYC Wired community. And Brian Bauman building out a great network with the Cube. This is our East Coast presence. We are here with Andy and, and Pete. Here with Astrometer, going to break down all the action. Hot startup, Cube alumni. Uh, last at Reno, we talked to them. guys. Great. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. It's great to be here, John. Appreciate you having us. So, give us the update. Uh, you guys were just recently on at Reinvent, uh, Amazon's annual conference just last year. One's coming up again. Um, we haven't really touched base. What's the update? Obviously, Gen AI is hot. Uh, but give us the update real quick, then we can get into some of the AI questions. Yeah, John, I, you know, I like to use the analogy. I think 10 years ago, Andreessen Horowitz came out saying, you know, software's eating the world, and I think data's feeding the world. And we're, we're right in the middle of that right now. So, um, you know, what we do is central casting and really, I'd say, uh, the central nervous system for delivering data to hydrate. Uh, these large yep. AI models, and we're seeing the explosion yep. of that happen in our business right now. Yeah, I mean, your customer base has um, been doing quite well. There's been a little hoarding of the GPUs, but still, I mean, you see the sector, it's a secular trend. Obviously, I talk, I love the super cycle word, Dave, and I love that. Some people don't like it. I had a previous guest on, Arcus, and you know they're all school networking guys. Yep. And, mm -hmm. if you, if, and we were talking about the 1986 to 96 years Okay, I was actually living that in the middle of that super cycle. Literally in the 10 years in the landscape was completely changed overnight. Mm -hmm. Proprietary network operating systems run on the big mainframe and mini computers to open systems. Now we're seeing an open systems revolution again, mm -hmm. combined with large scale supercomputing power being democratized. So you're seeing kind of every theater of of technologies exploding with innovation, infrastructure, middleware, just generically say middleware, it's just software, and then obviously the applications are being infused with you know, data, assistance, agentic systems coming around the corner. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a seismic uh, event in the industry. It's a super cycle. It certainly where, is. Where, where are we in this right now? Where are, where's the progress bar? Where are we on this progress? Yeah, no, it's a really great question, John. Look, I think um, we're certainly feeling the tailwinds of this movement in our business, and we're very, we're very, um, we're very grateful for that, and also very, very optimistic about our future. Mm -hmm. I think one of our key observations is that folks have really been doing machine learning and AI for mm -hmm. a very long time, but until the advent of these foundational models, you had to kind of sink a, a pretty big capex investment into actually making AI happen. Mm -hmm. You had to go hire a bunch of very specialized resources. You yeah. had to spend a lot of money on mm -hmm. GPUs to go train these models that your specialized AI researchers are going to write. And you also had to find a way to deliver them trustworthy, clean data. Now, with the advent of large language models, the barrier to entry to doing AI has decreased considerably. Now you don't need to go hire specialized resources and you don't need to spend money on GPUs to train these models because you can just access them via mm -hmm. an API. Uh, and pull them off the shelf, right? These pre-written, pre-trained models. However, we, we are still seeing a lot of uh, challenges in actually going to production, even with generative AI. Mm -hmm. And even Gartner is predicting that 30% of these Gen AI projects are going to fail by the end of next year. So one of the key questions on our mind is why yeah. is that? Why yeah. are these projects failing? And our perspective is that the challenge of actually delivering clean, trustworthy data to fine tune these models is the gap between prototype and production. It's now so easy to prototype with large language models. I've even seen interns build really yeah. revolutionary projects that, that make my jaw yeah. drop. Um, but, but actually making sure that those models are fine-tuned with domain-specific data that is trustworthy and reliable is the thing that's preventing folks from actually going and driving highly strategic yeah. business outcomes with AI. And our perspective is that that's just a data engineering problem. It's the same data yeah. engineering problem folks <laughs> have been working to solve for a very long time. Delivering reliable, yeah. clean, trustworthy data requires a bunch of facilities that are just challenging to implement. And um, that's where we play at the end of the you day. Know, Pete, you bring up a easier. good point. I mean, I do like this idea of prototyping because you know, it's easy to build a RAG system if you have a small data set. That's right. Okay, once you start connecting either larger scale data or trying to integrate in intelligently with other data, yeah. you start to get into a little bit of a messy situation. And you guys, again, have experience with the large scale data sets. This is, becomes the crossover from the scale question to real where AI need, needs to be successful. Uh, I would also say from our observations on theCUBE is, is that um, the boardrooms are saying, we need an AI strategy, and then the bottoms up works like, wait a minute, our platform's not really ready, we're just getting Kubernetes automated. Mm -hmm. like, so, yeah. so you're seeing a lot of that in the plumbing, and also there's a lot of engineering going on at the processor level, so you have a lot of infrastructure stuff that will flip soon to be completely stable. 
but now the app side is like, I got to play with the data. So we're kind of in this experimentation right. mode. So take me through how you guys are seeing your customers now because training's obviously hot because that's one thing, but inference will be the killer app because that's when you start to, that's when you graduate school. When you're trained, you're in school basically. And then you know, inference is like, okay, I'm using data. Now I'm connecting to intentional relationships or delegating authority to another mm -hmm. data set. Yep. You're in a different service level than just a microservice, just saying, hey, I'm going to do a, you know, Andy, a, a data exchange with you, yep. but we're not, it's just not an API call, you're connected to me. That's right. The data has to connect and be accurate, That's vetted. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's not easy. So, so I think, you know, when you go through um, those, these big use cases, yeah. John, and I think actually to bring it even back to what you mentioned before, mm -hmm. The transformation that's happening now is happening in the course of months, not years. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is that the constant foundation of that is people need data, right? And what we do is just deliver data at scale to a modern stack. So, um, and the, so that connection for us is super important. Our ability to make that connection, which is what we do is really important. But then also the ability to say, okay, once that connection's made, we can provide you observability into that mm -hmm. connection. We can provide you quality of service into that connection. So the data that's being delivered between you and I, yeah. as an example, we know that that quality of service is going to be really yeah. high. We can assure that the security around that data, which is on everybody's mind today, is very high as well. And then the third thing is around cost management. We hear yeah. that all the time, yeah. which is when that connection's made between you and I and then, you know, frankly, hundreds of thousands of other connections, the cost associated with that, which is on everybody's mind right yeah. now, has to be low, and we provide that ability to keep the cost low as well. You brought up cost, that's a good point. I want to get your both thoughts on this next um, section of conversation around productivity. Mm -hmm. Obviously, AI is showing, it's not a either or an inspection, go big or go home. There's a nice middle ground of productivity, low-hanging fruit you can knock that's down right. in an enterprise. When you get through that, you know, the, the prototype, you're okay, yeah. let's pick up a use case. Productivity gains, at the expense of high CPU costs. Yeah, yeah. So this is where you start to get into that, the lines cross. You got to have your innovation value proposition yielding enough value that the cost envelope is within that reason. A lot of people I talk to are like, look, I can throw GPUs at a problem right. and generate some productivity, but we didn't win back that, that piece. Yeah, I, th I think what we're finding, John, is that like productivity and dollars aren't actually the limiting factor in driving strategic outcomes. You mentioned earlier a lot of the discussion in boardrooms is finding a way to infuse yeah. AI into all of these core businesses. I think every single company in the world, and we actually see this in the field from supply chain to Ford to some of the most uh, advanced e-commerce businesses in the world, all of them have, have ways to leverage AI in a way that's strategic. But at the end of the day, the outcomes that you deliver are actually not going to be constrained by how fast people can prototype because prototyping has yeah. become a commodity yeah. at the end of the day. It's very easy for someone fresh out of college with a CS theory yeah. to go build something fairly robust in a yeah. little rag application. Now, the truly differentiated outcomes are going to come when people are solving problems that are high context, mm -hmm. very important and strategic to the business outcome itself, mm -hmm. and are actually domain specific. So you have some level of domain specific data that's differentiated that allows you to build an IP moat around what you're actually doing at the end of the day. And you know we see this in our customer base right yeah. now. It's pretty it's pretty remarkable what some folks are doing. Um, I mentioned I mentioned Ford. Yeah. Ford is using uh, our product and orchestration generally to train a lot of their advanced driver assistance systems yeah. models. So we're talking about terabytes of data every single day coming from radar and on-site kind of cameras on these vehicles, coming back to the data platform team to then go retrain these autonomous driving models yeah. so that they can actually go be competitive with some of the more more. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, modern players in the space four has obviously been around for. A what's your profile time. customer size-wise? They is it? What's the engagement look like? Take us through a day in the life of Astronomer or you guys when customers. Is it big data sets? Is it workflows? Is it which asset class? Because I mean, workflows are assets mm -hmm. now, not just yeah. data. It's data and workflows are assets. Mm -hmm. Scope where you guys are winning, where most of your engagements are. Yeah, I think um, first of all, any company that has a large proliferation of data we can have a great conversation with. And that data can be used for really a couple different things. And we're starting to see the evolution of the data being used for what we are starting to term as a data product, which is you know a byproduct in some cases of the yeah. AI stack. 
And uh, I'll give you an example. So in one of the largest uh, retailers in the world, as an example, um, they're using their data to make better decisions around their support cases, right? They're also yeah. using their data um, to make better decisions on how to route their supply chain to get people packages in a much more faster, consistent way. Mm -hmm. um, in another case, there's you know a large uh, technology company that uses um, data to make more uh, decisions around their product, who to sell to, and frankly, to have a better experience around their product. So for us, that's how we think of data, and every company in the world is trying to do that today. Yeah, exactly. So we're not tethered to like one vertical or one market. I think anybody that wants to get more value yeah. out of data, that's a great company for us to speak to. Enterprise AI is such an untapped market because the workflows are domain specific. You mentioned that earlier. You can't just throw AI at the enterprise because there's a lot of knobs and buttons that are pushed all over the place. That's right. I mean, well, that's using that as a metaphor, but you know, identity access. Okay, I'm going to have an edge use case that has to tie into a core cloud. I got to mm -hmm. harmonize that data set and have compute on the device. I mean, an architectural shift is happening at the same time as everyone's rolling in these data value oriented workflows. Mm -hmm. That's right. How do you guys engage with customers there? Is it a mix of service and platform? Because if you look at agentic systems, that's going to change the professional services business and move that into software economics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so that's a good scenario for platform companies. So, so maybe you know, Pete, I'll hand it over to you in a minute. But sure, yeah. I think the other piece that's happening too, John, is we're seeing more companies that are building out a modern stack, mm -hmm. right, to go and and implement AI, and then there's in many cases a legacy stack too, and they're trying to figure out what to do with that stack, right? Do they bring that data over to the modern stack? Do they keep that data where it is? Do they keep the modern stack? And it, a lot of it is around productivity and cost efficiency yeah, yeah. there. Mm -hmm. So um, we help on both sides, yeah, right? Yeah. So we look at you know our kind of like business value is we can help companies deliver on a modern stack, and then we can help companies over time move more of these legacy data you know workloads onto the modern stack to make their company more productive. Yeah. And modern stack, you don't mean rip and replace. No. And to right. add a new stack into the new elements into the mix and integrate. That's right. And then if it goes away, I think it goes away. If, old, if the old goes away, then you don't need to kill the old to bring in the new. If it does, yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. and specifically, like in that legacy stack, there's a lot. I mean, that's a highly valuable stack for many, many companies. I mean, AI is an abstraction opportunity to put, right. pave over legacy, but the future isn't paving the cow path. No. Okay, that's it's right. it's to build the new thing. That's right? right. I think the caveat there, which which I think is, you make a really good point, John, is. A lot of these modern AI workflows are just extensions of the data work that people have been doing in the modern data stack yeah. for the last decade or decade plus, right, as in the advent of the cloud. A lot of the AI problems are really just data engineering problems at the end of the day. You mentioned earlier some of the maybe enterprise red tape or guardrails that are common when you go actually attached to one of these AI initiatives that's mm -hmm. being rolled out. You have to have good governance. There are yeah. a lot of knobs and switches, good, good access controls, good security. All yeah. of the things that come into actually adopting software and production context in the enterprise are very true yeah. for this AI category of workload. Now, those things are very, very, <laughs> share a lot of commonality with yeah. any sort of data initiative. So the foundation that we're building and what we're focused on with respect to both migrating away from legacy systems and helping with yeah. services is building upon that strong foundation so that folks are actually given the governance abstractions that they need, the yeah. observability abstractions they need, and the security abstractions they need to go actually drive these projects forward and not be limited by their internal red tape. That's a great point. In fact, when I had the interview with you guys at reInvent last year with the Cube in the press area, um, I was energized by the conversation because when, when you see the, wow, this thing, these guys got it right. It's the data ops looks a lot like the old security shift left conversation. You have That's two right. things going on right now. You have the, the operating players saying, look, we have to get a stable environment to your point and get it set up and then have the practitioners in the company who are the real domain experts become the value brokers yeah. because mm -hmm. the, the value will come from the people who know the systems. Uh, and so I call that new, the new IT, because they have to set the table for the trust and the delegation of the agent connection. Because mm -hmm. automating things for the sake of automating doesn't really do anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can automate bad process, mm -hmm. but if you don't delegate trust and have that workflow nailed on the, the domain specificity, you, you're going to be hosed, that's basically. Right. That's and that, right. And that's exactly, what you're describing is exactly why kind of the platform is so important. 
because if you deliver or if you push value down to those brokers at the end of the day, they need to be enabled with the technology and infrastructure needed to actually drive yeah. outcomes. There are a lot of people that can go work with these large language models, but can you work with them in context inside yeah. the four walls of your organization? Yeah. And from our perspective, that, that, that ties to your point about data ops, right? The, yeah. the key to actually going and moving the ball forward with real production, real world AI use cases yeah. is a really strong data ops foundation. It's interesting, yeah. the data science and the analytics team have been doing business analytics for over a decade. I remember when we started theCUBE 15 years ago in New York, we'd have huge Hadoop events. We all know yeah. that was hard to implement, and Spark came in, then Data Lake emerged. Yeah. Okay, but so progression. <coughs> These data scientists doesn't mean they're mutually exclusive against the data engineering that's being done right now. So yeah. platform engineering and cloud native, to me, is a precursor to what will be data engineering, that's which is right. happening right now. And they work with that next layer, which is the data science business people, I call the business people, and that's where I think see that coming together because the agentic has to have the guardrails mm -hmm. because you can't have horizontally scalable data if, if you don't govern it because low latency data access is the key to generative AI because mm -hmm. yeah. it's not a pre-programmed thing. You don't know the prompt. Things mm -hmm. are going to happen in real time and iterate and self-learn. The, the reasoning turns into reinforced learning, self-healing. When that hits, you can't have a centralized repo. No. Now you okay. can centralize things, but you can co-locate it at, at horizontally so it can be domain specific. Mm -hmm. So those are two things are have to be going on at the same time. They do, and that's actually, yeah. you know, John, how Pete and I on the way in here are talking about this specific problem, okay. ironically. Um, look, the way we engage customers, we're going through this whole stack with the whole transformation happening and everybody's turning to you know, um, us in particular around just data movement, data orchestration on like, what do we do, right? And I think our engagement model, like as an example with yeah. Northern Trust, which yeah. is a great customer of ours, they're standing up um, a modern kind of technology stack and like we mentioned before, moving some of these legacy products onto their modern technology stack. It's not a lift yeah. and shift, but it yeah. is over time. And we're, we're the ones that are set up really well right yeah. now to go yeah. help companies with these conversations. We have, the knowledge and expertise around how to hydrate these AI models securely and at scale and cost effectively. Explain what hydrating the AI models means. A lot of people might not know what that means. What that means specifically, it's a really simple concept, John. It's supplying data through a pipeline to an AI workload, right? It's making sure that that, work, that, that AI workload has the right data to tune LLMs and to make the, and, and do it securely and at scale, right? So we're the yeah. ones pumping that data. You got into a these good workloads. connection. The water's fresh. That's right. <laughs> You're right. Well, it's, 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 it's secure, <laughs> right? And the data that that fresh yeah. water is going to make yeah. sure that yeah. that AI model grows and yeah. grows and yeah. grows, right? So we have that kind of on one part of a company, and then another part of the company. It's like, how do we take the existing data that we have and potentially leverage that into these modern models? And so. In the case of Northern Trust, as an example, yeah. we went and prescribed exactly how to do that, and uh, we had a really successful migration for that company in particular. The other thing we look at as well around um, just customer success and making sure that our customers are getting value out of what yeah. we do is just, you know, the adoption rate of our product, it's consistently over 90%, which is best in class in, mm -hmm. in you know, give, a customer, give some customer use cases, on, and I know you guys got a lot of big customers, um, but you sure. really can't say their names, but for the ones you can't say their names, say their names. I mean, people want to see use cases, because yes. what's, what, we, they're very much a hands-on all around the companies we talk to, everyone's got their hands in. I mean, how could you not get excited about generative AI? That's it's right. definitely game changing, no That's doubt right. about it. But what is the use cases that you guys have been successful at? Can you share a few? Yeah, yeah. I, I can maybe start. Okay. I mean, Andy and I spent a ton of time with our biggest strategic customers on how they're implementing our product and yeah. uh, re really try to glean as much as we can about what they're doing. At the end of the day, what we find is people start with data engineering when they work with us and work with orchestration, but data engineering is just, or excuse me, AI engineering is just data engineering at the yeah. end of the day. And without that strong data engineering foundation, hydrating these models and actually delivering them clean, trustworthy data that you can tune and actually use to drive domain-specific outcomes is impossible. So um, what often happens is somebody will adopt us for a data engineering use case and very quickly we will be in the weeds of AI discussions. Uh, the largest travel website in the world uh, is, is, a, is a customer of ours, or one of the largest travel websites in the world. And we started working with them on a lot of their internal reporting pipelines at the end of the day. But very quickly, the conversation changed to going, changed to going and fine-tuning an off-the-shelf, open-source, large language model to uh, serve an yeah. agentic workflow inside the application. So now if you're going and booking a, a 
uh, trip on their application, you can just talk to the bot and say, hey, I want to go to Sicily. <laughs> yeah. Tell me what the best time to go is, the best place to stay, and we'll just take care of it for you. Another really exciting one that we're energized by is a lesser known company, but one that's doing really important work called Vibrant Planet. What they're doing is they're actually ingesting a massive amount of weather and climate data on a daily basis mm -hmm. and training their own kind of traditional machine learning models to predict where wildfires are likely to happen for local, uh, for local fire departments across the western continental United States. So what they're doing at the end of the day is using mm -hmm. machine learning and using this next generation technology to actually do something that's very good for the world. What's the name of that company? Vibrant Planet. They should have been on when we were here for Climate Week. Yeah, no, they're, next it's, time. it's incredible sure, stuff. Yeah. Um, well, that's a game and again, like, this, is, this is fairly yeah. ubiquitous across our customer base. People, people very quickly evolve from data engineering to AI engineering. That's and, interesting um, progression, Pete, because like, one of the things I observe is, I met with this big uh, group, um, I won't say their name, because I don't have permission, but they do a lot of business data and B2B data. Yeah. We were having a conversation, like, what, use AI to first figure out what you have. Mm -hmm. Because their aperture for services has grown because they have basically everything about business is out there, their products are changing because of what AI is doing. So the first mm -hmm. wasn't, I mean, they had the workflow stuff you nailed know, down, low, low hanging fruit, they got some nice workflows, but their big aha moment was, we got more value in the data here than we ever thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that opens up again to your point, you're in the weeds and then you go, okay, but look at this. You're smiling because that's yeah, probably yeah. happening, right? Oh, I mean, hundred I mean, percent. I mean, it happens in our company. Yeah. That's how that's how we make a lot of. This is like decisions. generational, real time value. This is proof points that the Gen AI is going to unlock it, it's, new value that's never been seen before because you got faster compute. You have agentic coming around the corner with the, but the precursor is just pipelining and doing plumbing. That's that, right. That's hundred percent right, John. And I think that's what gets us super excited about the future, specifically for our company. But at the end of the day, there are going to be world-changing outcomes unlocked by AI, and also, yeah. of course, specifically generative AI. There's no question about that. But the real gap today is a data engineering problem. Yeah. And that's what gets us really excited about the future because we know how to solve those problems. Okay, so is, is that a shift scale. right or shift left conversation? <laughs> because it's a good question. Uh, because yeah. I think that in the CICD pipeline, developers yeah. will be dealing with data decisions with with either voice activation or coding in line, yep. like security. Mm -hmm. yep. When you start to get into these clean pipelines, yeah. and you have this, these guardrails with governance, I think data will be free to fly all over the place, yep. and then manage from governance, kind of central, co-located, intelligent OS, yep. you can provide developers real-time right. coding, mm -hmm. or enabling an agent to either check another sub-agent yep. to right. make calls on the fly, and change the outcome for the user experience. That's right. Nope. We see. Oh, sorry. We, we see it going yeah. in both directions: shift right and shift left, because we're pulling it into the developer workflow itself and making it much easier to deploy these things. But also, what then becomes important as data explodes is the unit economics of this data. Right? We talked yeah. earlier about cost of CPU and productivity. That's nothing compared to the cost of these exploding data platforms at the end of the day. So, yeah. as yeah. people really invest in these data platforms to drive these differentiated outcomes, understanding the unit economics of all of your data infrastructure is super important. Well guys, it's been great to have you on theCUBE again here in our new location. We'll maybe see it reinvent. Yeah. Certainly let's keep in touch. Final word, what's, give a quick plug for Astrometer. What are you guys looking to do? You're hiring, you're building out. What should customers, why should they call you? What, is the house on fire? Is there, what, what, what sign would tell a customer to call you guys? Give, give the plug. So first, we are hiring always. We're always looking <laughs> for the best talent. Second is, <laughs> Anybody that wants to make use of their data as a competitive advantage or yeah. anything associated to um, you know, making their company better, yeah. call us. Guys, power in the next generation. I'm John Furrier here in our studio in the NYSC Wired community. We're building an open network, Silicon Valley connecting into Wall Street with NYSC Brian Bauman and the team. The Cube will have a set here. We'll continue to program as much as we can at any time, all day. If you want to come on, give me a ping on DM and we'll connect. Thanks for watching.